Welcome to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the president and founder of Creation Training Initiative, or CTI. What we do at CTI is offer training courses. That's our specialty. Training courses from one day all the way up to five days for Christians who are interested in getting more knowledge about creation evolution or biblical apologetics. And our courses range anywhere from beginning courses all the way up to advanced courses. Well, in the last series, we've been talking about biblical apologetics, how to defend your faith. And we have a very interesting topic today on apologetics called, Is the Big Bang Compatible with the Bible? Or, Did God Use the Big Bang as Part of His Creation Process? Well, to start with, the Big Bang. What is it? It's a secular story about origins. The original intent of the Big Bang, when it was first introduced, was how to describe this universe, how it came into existence without God. So it's a complete secular story from the beginning. Now, before we go any further, I want to make sure we understand something very clearly, that we're not talking about a battle between science and the Bible. That is completely wrong here. Why? Because who created all the scientific principles? God did. He's not in a battle with himself. You see, God created the science. Science is God. Good. It helps us when we discover more and more about who God is and His great power and majesty. So the battle's not between science and the Bible. The battle is really between something called evolutionism and God's Word, the Bible. So now that we got that straight, the Big Bang, what is it? It's again, it's a story about how the universe came into existence all by itself. God had nothing to do with it. It presupposes billions and billions of years of naturalistic processes. This universe started as a hot fireball, a, a point in time. Now the question about that is, where did that point in time come from? Where did that original matter come from? And then we're told after some unknown amount of time here, this point out there, this ball of matter that contained all the matter for all the stars, the galaxies, planets, and life, began to expand in a hot fireball. Now, the question I have is, where does God fit in all this? See, we're commonly told in many churches, well, maybe God used the Big Bang as part of his creation process. So that's what we want to talk about here today in apologetics. Is the Big Bang compatible with the Bible? Did God use the Big Bang as part of his creation process? To do that, we're going to examine three different areas of evidence. And the first one is going to be the Bible. Imagine that. We're going to start with the Bible. You see, here's the first problem we have. A lot of people don't start with the Bible. They start with man's wisdom. Oh, so many scientists believe this. We're all scientists believe this. First of all, all scientists don't believe it. But many scientists believe in the Big Bang. Therefore, it must be true. Well, what about God's Word? Why don't we start with God's Word? What does the Bible have to teach about creation? Secondly, we're going to go to an area called the Bible logic, and the Big Bang. Are they compatible? And lastly, our third topic will be the Big Bang and science. Does the Big Bang agree with true science? So those will be our three evidences we're going to look at. Well, let's start with the Bible here. The Bible and the Big Bang. What does the Bible teach? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible clearly teaches that God created everything in six literal days. However, the Big Bang teaches billions of years. Well, how do we reconcile that? Well, it's going to determine your starting point. Do you start with man's wisdom, or are we going to start with the Bible here? So when we start with the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, God chose the word day. Now remember, all God's word is breathed through him. It's written down by man, but it's inspired by God. And it's true. And in Genesis chapter 1, it reads first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. God specifically used the word day there. And then we see a number with the word day. And everywhere in the Old Testament we have a number with the word day. It only means a day, never a long period of time. We also see that God defined his days, evening and morning first day, evening and morning second day. That always means a day in the Old Testament. And thirdly, in Exodus 20, verse 11, in the Ten Commandments, commandment number four, God wrote this down. 
For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So it's very clear that God's creation was six days, not millions or billions of years. So there's the first contradiction there. The Bible and Big Bang are not compatible. The Bible also teaches that God's works are perfect. Well, what does that mean? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 states this. He is the rock. His work is perfect. So God's works are perfect. Also in Job 36, 4 we read, For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. And then we go to Genesis 1.31. Let's turn back to the book of Genesis. Now that we see the Bible teaches God's works are perfect. In Genesis 1, verse 31, God has just finished his creation, his six days of creation. And he makes this statement. He calls his entire creation very good. And creation is the works of God. And the Bible taught us that God's works are perfect. So his creation was perfect. But Big Bang cosmology teaches something very different. Big Bang cosmology teaches billions of years of chaos and destruction all going on. Just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Now the Bible also teaches that God is the creator of all things. But Big Bang cosmology says no. Man's wisdom says no. The, the Big Bang is full of billions of years of, again, decay and that the stars evolve by naturalistic processes. Galaxies evolve by naturalistic processes. And planets evolve by naturalistic processes. Now let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. The Bible does teach that God created all things. Well, where does it teach that? Well, how about the first book of the Bible? Genesis chapter 1 clearly teaches again, God created all things in six days. But that's not the only place God taught this. We see in His Word, all through His Word, that He is the Creator of all things. For example, again, Exodus 20, verse 11, where God wrote this down in the Ten Commandments. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. We also see in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 12, it reads, I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hand, stretched out the heavens, and all their host I have commanded. So there in the book of Isaiah, God is the creator of all things. We see it also again in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, where it reads, You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. There's the book of Nehemiah saying God is the creator of all things. We can turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 17, where it reads, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And then we can even turn to the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. We go to the book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 15. The living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in him. How about the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 9. God who created all things through Jesus Christ. We can turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16, where it reads, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And we can even turn to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, where we read, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Well, I have a question. Is there any doubt after reading just these scriptures, and there's many more, just these scriptures, is there any doubt that God is the creator of all things, which includes the stars, the galaxies, the planets, and all life? There should be no doubt. Therefore, the Big Bang is not compatible with the Bible, unless you choose not to believe God's Word. You see, it's our starting point. 
Do you start with God's word or are we starting with man's wisdom? And we've just seen these two are not compatible. Well, let's go to our evidence number two now. We just talked about what the Bible taught, that God created everything in six days, not billions of years, and that God is the creator of all things, not some things, but all things. So our evidence number two is the Bible, logic, and the Big Bang. Now, let's take a look at something called logic here. And to do that, we're going to go to something called the law of non-contradiction. It's a law. It's a classical law in logic. And what does it teach? What it basically teaches is this. Two opposites both can't be true in the same context or same time and place. If you've only got two choices and they are opposite, what that means is one of them's true and one of them's false. It's like looking at a chair in a room and making this statement. That chair is here and it is not here. That is an illogical statement. Either it is here or it is not here, but it cannot be both. That's what we mean by the law of non-contradiction. So let's take a look and compare God's order of creation with Big Bang cosmology and the order everything came into existence according to man's wisdom. In the Bible, it clearly teaches God the earth made, made the earth on day one and the stars on day four. So notice the order, earth first, then stars. But Big Bang cosmology teaches the stars evolved first, then maybe millions to billions of years later came the earth. Those two are opposite in order. They both cannot be true. The Bible teaches God created the flying creatures, the birds, on day five, and the land animals, which would include reptiles, on day six. Birds first, then reptiles. But when we talk about evolution, reptiles evolved first, and then came birds. The Bible teaches God formed this earth out of a watery mass. But evolution teaches it came from a hot fireball. The Bible teaches that land plants were created on day three and the sun on day four. Evolution teaches the sun was evolved on day way before plants. The sun came first, then came plants. And the Bible clearly teaches, and this one's very important, that man was here first, then came death. But you see, evolution teaches millions of years of death and decay, and then came man. That affects the very gospel of Jesus Christ right there because that teaches death before sin. That is part of the Big Bang cosmology, death, decay, and destruction before sin. So is the Big Bang compatible with the Bible? Absolutely not. Both logic and the Bible clearly show God did not use the Big Bang unless you willfully choose not to believe the plain reading of God's Word. Well, now let's go to the third evidence, science. Let's compare science to the Big Bang. Well, the Big Bang does have many, many scientific problems. The first problem with this is most people aren't aware of this because they're never taught this in the public education system. We don't even see most of the problems even in textbooks. They're just ignored, censored out. Why? To protect the Big Bang. Not science, but the Big Bang. So let's look at problem, scientific problem number one, and that is the origin of the universe. This is a big problem, folks, the origin of the universe. Where did the matter come from that create this Big Bang? And let me read you a quote from a science journal here, and it reads this way. Prior to the singularity, that's this original point out there, that suddenly expanded in space and time called the Big Bang, this original point that contained all the star, all the matter for all the stars and the galaxies and the planets. So prior to the singularity, nothing existed. And then it goes on to say this, not space, time, matter, energy, nothing. So where and in what did the singularity appear if not in space? We don't know. We don't know where it came from, why it's here, or even where it is. All we really know is that we are inside of it, and at one time it didn't exist, and neither did we. What a quote. No idea where any of this came from. All they believe is we're here, that's it. But no scientific evidence where this matter came from. This is a big, big problem for evolutionists. Where did the matter come from to create this so-called Big Bang? Because what we know from good science and logic it's that from nothing, 
nothing comes. Now that is good science and logic. Now, some people sitting in church will try and get around this issue. And what they'll say is, well, God created the first matter and then let it explode into a big bang. And that's their explanation for how God used the big bang. That's how they get around where did the original matter come from. Well, God put it there and then used the big bang. Well, I have a challenge to this kind of a statement. Where in the Bible do you find this information that God used the big bang? I challenge you on that. Nowhere in the Bible will you see God stating he used the Big Bang. It is not there. It is not compatible with the Bible. But people will still try and get around this. We'll say, they'll make this statement. Well, the Bible really doesn't teach how God created. Therefore, he could have used the Big Bang. Wrong statement again. You see, the Bible does teach how God created. I don't know where these people are getting this idea the Bible doesn't teach how God created. It's in the Bible. Multiple places in the Bible clearly teach how God created. We can just turn to the first chapter in the book of Genesis. The first chapter in the entire Bible where we see this phrase, and God said. We see that phrase ten times in Genesis chapter 1. And what is it telling us? God spoke everything into existence by His Word. He didn't use Legos. He didn't need any pre-existing material. He simply spoke and it was there. We see this also again in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 33 verses 6 and 9 where we read this. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. He spoke and it was done. Wow, what a testimony to how God created. We even see this again in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 3. Created by the word of God. You see, that's how God did it. He spoke it into existence by his great power. And since we can't understand that, people are just saying, oh, he couldn't have done it that way. Well, folks, let's stop trying to play God out there. We're not God. We're part of the creation. And our God, the God of the Bible, nothing is too hard for him. He clearly told us he spoke it into existence by his great power. So that's scientific problem number one. Where did the matter come from for the great the Big Bang? Well, let's go to scientific problem number two, galaxy formation. You see, the Big Bang is unable to explain the origin of galaxies. It is all speculation. Let me read you a quote from a scientist, and it states, we have no direct evidence of how galaxies were formed or how galaxies evolved. Now, that is the truth of science. We have no idea how the galaxies formed. All we have is speculation. It's never been observed. So there's two scientific problems. Let's go to scientific problem number three, and this is star formation. The Big Bang cannot explain the origin of stars. It is only speculation. Now, the standard story is given in high school biology textbooks or in other science books. Let me read you a quote from one of our high school science textbooks, How Stars Form, and it reads, all stars form in much the same matter as the sun did. The formation of a star begins with a cloud of interstellar gas and dust called a nebula, which collapses on itself as a result of its own gravity. The condensed object will become a new star. That's what they're teaching in our education system. Now, let me recap what they just said there. We get these great big gas and dust clouds out there called nebula, and they rotate around and around and around, and they are doing that. And as they rotate around and around and around, they begin to gravitationally collapse inward due to the rotation there, and that is true. But what they're not telling you is the rest of the story, and the rest of the story, folks, is called science, not belief system. See, as this cloud condenses in on itself, it generates something called heat pressure. And this is something we can measure. You can go to a Physics 101 book and see this information. As that cloud begins to collapse inward, it generates heat pressure. And that heat pressure is stronger than that gravity and will always cause that cloud to expand outward. You see, we're not teaching science anymore. What we're teaching is evolution in our classes. Let me read you some quotes from some scientists. And you're going to notice 
every one of these quotes by these scientists, and not all are creationists, contradict what we see in our textbooks. Here's one from Dr. Don DeYoung, who has his PhD in physics. He, I quote, the complete birth of a star has never been observed. Here's another quote from Jason Lyle, who has his PhD in astrophysics, and he reads, it, star formation, has never been observed. Nor could it truly be observed since the process is supposed to take hundreds of thousands of years. Gas in space is very resistant to being compressed into a star. Compression of gas causes an increase in magnetic field strength, gas pressure, and angular momentum. There he gives three pieces, three evidences that show as that cloud begins to collapse in due to the gravitational collapse and rotation, the heat pressure and magnetic field will all cause it to expand outward. No one's ever observed a star form. Now here's another one from Charles Latta. Now Charles Latta, he's an astronomer from the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. And he makes this statement about stars and formation. Quote, despite the spectacular success in explaining the life histories and death of stars, the theory of stellar evolution is incomplete in, very, in a very fundamental aspect. It is not able to account for the origin of stars. Now, what are we to make of what we're doing in our education system? We're not teaching science. We're promoting evolution. Now, let's get to scientific problem number four. Population three stars. And that is another major problem for the Big Bang. Population three stars. Now, hold on. What do we mean by population three stars? Let me explain what a population three star is. Well, first of all, the Big Bang, according to evolutionists, can only explain the three lightest elements we have out there. Hydrogen, helium, and elements of lithium. That's what the Big Bang can explain. That's according to evolutionists. The Big Bang can only explain the three lightest elements. Hydrogen, helium, and lithium. The heavier elements, where did they come from then? Well, those were produced by stars through their process, nuclear fusion, and their explosion when they, you burned up all the fuel. Second, what does this mean? That the first stars formed. Now, this is where we get to the definition of population three stars. Since the Big Bang can only account for, for the three lightest elements, that means the first stars that formed, and these are called the population three stars, were only comprised of the three lightest elements, hydrogen, helium, and traces of lithium. That's what we mean by population three star. It only contains the three lightest elements. And when those first stars burned up all their energy and exploded, those stars produced some of the heavier elements. And this is part of Big Bang cosmology. This is why we have all the elements out there. Well, if this is true, if this is true, that population three stars only contain the three lightest elements and they're responsible for the heavier elements, then we should find, we should be able to find some of these population three stars out there. But here's the problem. No one's ever observed a population three star. Nowhere in this universe have we found a star that only contains hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Every star we know of out there in the observable universe contains traces of heavier elements. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, contains about a hundred billion stars, but yet not one has been observed to contain only the three lightest elements. And those are what we call population three stars. That's why we call this a big problem for the Big Bang, missing population three stars. Now, let's go to scientific problems number five. This is called missing Antimatter. Now, we're not talking science fiction here now. There really is something called antimatter. Now, the Big Bang speculates that in the beginning, there was no, no matter, no mass. It was just energy. And this energy started to expand in a hot fireball, expansion of space and time. This is what the Big Bang is called. And as this energy expanded, it started converting some of the energy into matter. However, when energy is converted into matter, it also creates antimatter. As a matter of fact, when energy is converted into matter, we should get equal parts of matter and antimatter. 
Now, what's the difference between matter and antimatter? Well, that takes us inside the atom. We have those three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. The difference is the charge in the particles. For example, in matter, the proton has a positive charge. But in antimatter, the antiproton has a negative charge. So that's the distinction between matter and antimatter. Again, the big problem for the Big Bang here is, where is the antimatter? The entire universe is almost completely composed of matter. Very little antimatter has been discovered in the visible universe. But according to physics, when energy is converted into matter, equal parts of matter and antimatter should be created. So the Big Bang does not fit what we see or observe in science. Now let's go to scientific problem number six. And this is called scientist. Do all scientists believe the Big Bang? Absolutely not. In 2004, a group of scientists got together and wrote and signed a letter about the Big Bang. Now here's what they stated in their letter. Number one, an open exchange of ideas is not tolerated. And what they're talking about here is if you're going to talk about the Big Bang, you're, you must promote the Big Bang. In other words, any contradictory ideas are not tolerated. That's called censorship. That's what they're talking about here. Those scientists who promote the Big Bang also promote censorship. They don't want anybody else's ideas. That's called intolerance. And then secondly, they wrote and signed this. The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things we have never observed. That was 405 scientists signed that. Now, we're not even talking about the scientists we have at Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, Creation Ministries International, or Creation Resource Scientists. We're not talking about those. We're just talking about other scientists, many of which are secular scientists. 405 signed that letter saying, we don't have any observational evidence for the Big Bang, just hypothetical stories. Now, we've just gone through six evidences, six scientific evidences that contradict the Big Bang. We had the origin of matter. Where did the original matter come from? No answer. The origin of galaxies, mere speculation. The origin of stars, Speculation. Population three stars, those stars that only contain the three lightest elements. You can't find any of them. They should be out there. The missing antimatter. The universe should be comprised of 50% matter, 50% antimatter. It's mostly all matter. And then there are many, many scientists do, do not, that do not support the Big Bang. And there are many other scientific problems with the Big Bang. For example, spiral galaxies. As galaxies rotate around and around out there, they gradually lose their spiral shape. So why do we still have spiral galaxies? We shouldn't have them out there. The existence of comets, comets, objects that circle around our solar system. They lose their mass every time they go around the sun. They shouldn't be there anymore if this solar system is billions of years old. Supernova remnants, that's stars that have exploded in these great big gas and dust clouds. We don't find them big enough to explain millions and billions of years. The flatness problem, dealing with the gravity in expansion of the universe. And then the missing monopoles, as we have in magnets, a north and south pole. We don't have ones out there that just have single poles. And these are just some of the scientific problems with the Big Bang. So the Big Bang, folks, is not a fact. It's not even a theory, because theories have to be observable and repeatable. So why are so many people in church endorsing the Big Bang? Why do they try and insert the Big Bang into the Bible? Well, let me give you several reasons here. Number one, some people sitting in church just believe evolution is true. They believe everything about evolution is true, and God just kind of sits out there and guides it once in a while. Well, that is a result of our education system, teaching only evolution and not science. Secondly, some have never heard the truth about the Big Bang. And those are some of the evidence I just gave you. This is called a lack of education again. Not only in our secular schools, but folks in our Christian schools and in our churches and in our homes. We're not doing the education we should be doing. And then some would just like to be friends with the world. In other words, they don't want to be ridiculed for not being scientific. Well, folks, 
not being scientific is a belief in the Big Bang and evolution. But see, they would rather be friends with the world. In other words, they have more fear of man than they do of God. This is a big problem we have. If I don't believe in evolution, if I don't believe in the Big Bang, people might think I'm not smart. That's called rejecting God's word. Who are you ultimately accountable to, folks? Someday we're all going to stand before God and be accountable to Him, not the scientist. Another reason? Some people just don't believe the Bible's real history. And that presents a major issue here called the Scriptures. When I turn to chap John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. Okay, we're going to the book of John, chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. And Jesus makes this statement about the Bible's history. And I quote, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus believed the Old Testament was real history. He believed what Moses wrote about him. What did Moses write? He is accountable for having written the first books of the Bible, which includes Genesis. And here's Jesus saying, if you can't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? See, each of those problems I just came out with are about education. We have a lack of teaching going on in our churches, in our Christian schools, even in home. We've got to start equipping ourselves for this. You see, we're not being equipped to defend our faith. And I said home because where are we ultimately, who is ultimately responsible for the education of our children? Not the church, not the Christian school, but it's the parents, folks. We need to step up and start doing our job. Regardless of where we send our children, we are ultimately responsible for their education. So it starts in the home. And our children are not being trained to defend their faith. And as a result, many are simply leaving the church or compromising God's Word. Don't forget, folks, our children will one day stand before God also. And they will be accountable for what they believe. And then, we're really not equipping ourselves for the battle. We failed here. Our Christian universities, our Christian schools, are doing a good job in academics but they're not training our people for the battle. Therefore, our people cannot even go to the battle. Many don't even know there's a war going on. Let me read you a quote. This quote is credited to Martin Luther, and he states this, folks. If I profess with the loudest voice in the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not professing Christ. However boldly I may be confessing him, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. Folks, we need soldiers in our Christian universities. We need professors who are going to stand up and start training this next generation to be able to defend their faith against all these attacks. Yes, academia is good, but folks, there's a battle going on, and it's going on for the heart and soul of this nation. It's a battle to who's going to own this next generation. We need professors who are willing to stand on the authority of God's Word and train our people to stand up and defend God's Word. That's when we can start taking back this next generation. See, many people don't realize something else. You see, there's more to the story than just the beginning. The Big Bang is a story about beginnings, but what they don't understand is the Big Bang is also a story about how everything's going to end. According to the Big Bang, this universe will continue to expand for billions and billions of years. And as it expands, it continues to lose energy. And at some point in time, it will become what we call a dead universe. It will be in what we call a virtual heat death. And it will remain in that state forever and ever. That is Big Bang cosmology. But the Bible teaches something very different. The Bible teaches that God is going to come and judge this world, and then He's going to make everything new. In other words, He's going to restore paradise. 
So even the story about the end, the Big Bang, is completely different from what the Bible teaches. We see this in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Then in Revelation, chapter 21, verse 5, we read, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And then in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, we read, And there should be no more curse. In other words, God is going to make everything new. But the Big Bang denies this teaching of God's Word. Now, here it comes now. It's called consistency. If those folks out there in the church are believing the Big Bang, that God may have used the Big Bang over billions of years, are they also going to accept the teachings of the Big Bang about the end of everything, that everything's going to just die over billions and billions of years and just remain there forever and ever? You see, here's your consistency now. If you believe one part of the Big Bang, or are you going to believe the other part, or are you going to just pick and choose what you want to believe? You see, all throughout mankind, all throughout time, mankind has asked, many, many important questions out there. These are also called worldview questions, such as, how did the universe begin? How old is the universe? What caused it to exist? Why are we here? These are not simple questions for the non-believer to answer. Over time, throughout history, men and women have been looking for some clue. They spent years and years of their lifetime searching for answers to these questions. Where did the universe come from? Why does it exist? Why are we here? Where did we come from? A lot of time and energy has been spent looking for these answers. When folks, the answer has always been right in front of their face. And we find the answer again, and it reads this way. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Thank you, and God bless you. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's Word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear.